I can't believe I haven't told you guys this story yet, but I guess it's better late than never. And some of you might have already heard me say offhandedly that I auditioned for MasterChef Season 9 back in February of 2018. I was on a few seconds of the commercials, but I never actually ended up in an episode of the show. I wish I kept notes of you know this whole experience, the events, as I have a pretty poor memory, but I'm going to try my best here. Uh, to give some background, uh, I've worked in restaurants as a waiter or bartender, always had a passion for food, and I've experimented a lot on my own you know, in my personal kitchen. I cooked food regularly for my family and did carnivore type dishes for myself. So for those of you wondering, Frank, how are you cooking stuff if you were on the carnivore diet? The stuff I was cooking for myself was carnivore and you know, I would taste food and spit it out here or there. So at the time, when I was auditioning for this, my YouTube channel wasn't really that popular. Uh, so I figured, hey, this MasterChef thing might be a really good opportunity, might give me a new career direction in life. I mean, keep in mind, guys, I've been bartending up until, you know, even earlier, you know, 2019. I was still working in various hotels in Manhattan. So the audition was in September of 2017, and I drove down to this location they had in, I think it was a Marriott hotel. And I was actually one of the first people down there. And the audition required you to cook a dish. And I made three different types of sourdough breads with corresponding spreads. Uh, one was a bone marrow cream. One was a salmon roe crema. One was a mackerel butter. They liked my dish enough to get me through to this group interview phase. Then out of like 30 to 35 people, I was one of four or five that they chose to interview the next day, which involves me going back down to that hotel, being recorded on camera, you know, in my outfit, and they were gonna send that video to the producers. Over the course of the next few months, there were quite a few back and forth emails between myself and MasterChef Casting. Uh, initially, it was some background checks, then they asked me for my four signature dishes, but I wasn't actually told I had to go to LA until a week before I had to fly out. This was now early February 2018. At the time, I was working at Salt Bay Steakhouse, uh, which was the most lucrative job I've ever had in Manhattan. And I decided to leave it for my opportunity to go on MasterChef. And this was big for me, guys, because you know, I never really made a decent living in Manhattan. You, know, you guys might have heard like bartenders and waiters doing really well. I wasn't one of them. Uh, you know, I was barely making minimum wage and I finally had this like glimmer of hope, finally a good job. I'm making, you know, enough money to enjoy myself and relax and lose the stress. But I, I dropped it all and this wasn't even a guarantee to be on the show. This was again, like a final audition phase that required me to fly out to LA. And the persona they had me as was some slick Italian guy from New York City that like dressed up, wore suits. This is because I wore a suit to the audition. I know I thought it was, you know, a good idea. I had like all of this stuff I thrifted and, you know, I never wore it. So I packed up like 10 suits into this suitcase. Uh, they paid for my flight to go out to LA and they actually asked if my parents were able to make it out to like cheer me on. There were a couple scenes but they didn't offer to pay for my parents and my parents couldn't afford it at the time. In hindsight, the reason I didn't end up on the show was likely because my parents couldn't make it out there. And before I went out there, the casting team, the producers were like super excited to have me on the show. And as soon as my parents couldn't make it, it was like I was put on the back burner in a way, you know, I wasn't as important and even uh, when I was actually out in LA, I remember them having a few conversations with me like, are you sure your parents can't get out here? And I remember after those conversations, things really shifted gears from, you know, the priority of the casting around me. Uh, so it was a few thousand dollar mistake of, you know, what it would have cost my parents to fly out there. Uh, and that might have ended up actually getting me on the show. So uh, pretty, pretty unfortunate that, you know, I put so much effort into it and spent so much time and, you know, if I knew all of this in hindsight, I would have just, you know, you spent all of my savings for those plane tickets for my parents. Later, when I was talking to some of the other people that were auditioning for the show, I found out that they actually offered to pay for their parents to go out for free or their family members, that is. So I guess they thought I was well off and could afford to fly my family out. But uh, what are you going to do? So 
I arrive at the airport in LA and I'm irritated that my bag of 10 suits is on this carousel that's just like open to the public like anyone could just take the bag uh, but I guess that's LAX for you. Uh, my brother was actually there because he lives and works in Los Angeles. It was nice to see him uh, along with the MasterChef cast member that was like looking for me. They were wearing like a MasterChef shirt and there were also a few people from New York that I was chatting with because you know there were a bunch of other auditionees from New York that were on the flight to LA. Uh, so after waiting for a little while, a van picked us up and took us to a Marriott hotel where we had to give up our cell phones. And for the two weeks I was out there, couldn't leave the hotel, use a cell phone, no internet access, no contact with the outside world. I mean, you could call, I think your parents or like your family once every few days to check in on them. But it was kind of like this psychological experiments they were running on us and you know, we were bored out of our minds. And over the course of this two weeks, there were various scheduled events, you know, every one needed to attend them in some capacity, except for the weekends. You know, we had group meetings with producers, went to test kitchens to practice cooking, a lot of time sitting and waiting. I remember like every single time we got in the van, you know, we spent at least, you know, an hour, an hour and a half actually sitting in the van, you know, with the other cast members, you know, while we're either waiting to leave the hotel, uh, going to the production facility. But, you know, there was a few glimpses of actual fun, but it was mostly, you know, a lot of like meetings, sitting and waiting, no nothing too exciting. And I spent a lot of my downtime actually taking cooking notes, reading cookbooks. This is what I spent literally, you know, all of my time doing, literally just reading cookbooks. Uh, you were allowed to bring like you know, five cookbooks with you, I believe. And all I did this whole time was just like take notes of recipes, all ideas and stuff. I actually have that book that I spent, you know, dozens of hours over those two weeks coming up with recipes and that I, I haven't gone through again. I think I have it somewhere uh, in my room. Um, uh, I gotta go through it because there's a lot of carnivore recipes in there too. So, you know, I, I did take that from it. And there was actually this group challenge event uh, that we had uh, there where we had to prepare a dish with certain ingredients in a set time. And I realized how incompetent these other cooks were. You know, by no means am I a professional chef, but when you're out there, it, it puts into perspective how little most people know about cooking uh, let alone compare it to, you know, said professional chef who would literally walk circles around everyone. You know, it's like uh, comparing a major league baseball player to someone who's never played baseball in their life. You know, these master chef casting people, it has nothing to do with talent whatsoever. So the schedule was like a regular work week, you know, Monday through Friday during the day was when we spent most of the time doing the production stuff. And then on the weekends, we had the time off. We were still confined to the hotel on the weekends, couldn't really do anything. Most of the day was, as I said, sitting and waiting. Maybe we had a meeting, you know, maybe we went to the facility to work in the test kitchen for an hour, but you know, 90% of the day was us just sitting in a casting room that was really, really cold. It was LA in the middle of February. And for some reason I was freezing like my balls off the whole time. That's what I remember, how cold I was. I had like my long johns on, I was wearing a suit, yet I was still cold. So after we got back from the casting, most of the night was spent, you know, hanging around outside. The hotel had like a pretty nice pool, a nice patio, there was a bar. Uh, people were drinking, talking, like a reality show kind of setting. And it was interesting to see the stereotypes, you know, they had like three Southern guys for that stereotype, three black girls, three gay guys. And I remember I actually made this black girl cry because I told her that no one gives up about her biscuit recipe. And then there was this one like decent looking brunette girl that wanted to see me make out with one of the gay guys, but uh, no nothing, nothing too exciting or too crazy. They, the first night, like people were drinking a little too much, but there were some past like MasterChef seasons where it got really crazy. So, it was like almost like prison. Like we always had someone watching us at all times. There were like adult babysitters. You could tell they had problems in the past with like the hotel rooms and and now like for you know Master Chef season nine, they have things buckled down and they're running a tight ship. Uh, so each of us had a roommate. I had this like I can't remember the guy's name, but it was this massive black guy like six two six three like four hundred pounds. 
poor guy was a little overweight, but really sweet guy. Uh, I, I just wish, I, for some reason, I can't remember his name. It'll probably come to me. Um, I couldn't sleep the whole two weeks I was out there. The first week because that guy was snoring. And then when he was sent home, it was likely the high EMF environment. And if I knew how cheap those hotel rooms were, I would have paid, you know, $40 a night for that shithole hotel room just so I could, you know, have some privacy to myself. Uh, so after, you know, one week of all of this nonsense, they sent half of us home. So the audition started with like 70 or 80 people and now there were 40 left. So they had like three or four people for each of the stereotypes and they narrowed it down to two. I was one of these 40 people and this next week was to be us filming the initial cook-offs. Like the, this whole week has been tests, trials, seeing how you behave. We weren't really in front of the camera, you know, filming any of the show at all, but now it was showtime. So we had a weekend where we were still confined to the hotel, as I said, still no internet, no cell phone, no outside food besides a grocery store. And most of these people were eating like the hotel food, but me being on a high quality nutrient dense carnivore diet, I couldn't, you know, I didn't want to eat the bacon, the eggs, the sausage. I didn't want to eat any food there that I wasn't used to that might upset my stomach because I wasn't sleeping anyway. And this is where my health issues started getting really bad. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar, all of my sleeping problems and health issues started when I was out in LA on this show. You know, I, I can't emphasize that I literally did not fall asleep for two weeks straight. My head pain and my back pain was really high. I was taking the maximum dosage of Tylenol and Advil every few hours. And there are some interactions between Accutane, Retinol, Vitamin A, and Tylenol. That's definitely what triggered it. If I didn't start taking those painkillers and those pain medications, my problem might not have been nearly as bad. Uh, but you know, my health knowledge now could have prevented what's been you know a downward spiral of almost two years now. Uh, so the cook-offs that we were doing involved certain people filming on certain days. Like the southern people were against the other southern people. You know, I was against um, some black girl for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, like, but the stereotypes were pitted against the stereotypes and people were set to cook on certain days. And that day you cooked was the day you found out you were eliminated. And we were scheduled like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Unfortunately, I wasn't scheduled until Thursday. So I basically had to, you know, I was driven to the casting room, just had to sit in this room all day with everyone else. And, you know, we're waiting for the rest of the people while they're competing and we're like, you know, there's some scenes where like we're supposed to be part of a crowd, so we're part of the show, but it would have been nice to be on the Monday or Tuesday because I wouldn't have had to wait, you know, two, three, four days to know if I'm on the show or not. Uh, and, and by the way, guys, so we have a hotel where everyone is staying at, and then this van drives us to like a, a production studio. I can't remember specifically where it was, but like really tight security, and it's where they filmed all the MasterChef stuff. So all the MasterChef stuff was filmed at this like production studio. So granted, I would have been on the show, like it would have been where we would have been filming the whole time. And the food was so horrible. It was like so disgusting. There wasn't enough food. I like, I don't know how they could even, it was like, like the worst, like half cooked raw chicken. People were getting sick from the food they were eating. People were literally, <laughs> it was so bad. I don't know if it just wasn't in their budget, but people were literally vomiting and getting sick from the catered food that these people were eating. And, and my brother had it too. He was complaining about it so much. Um, uh, but from that grocery store that we went to, which was a Ralph's, oh, what's that? There was a famous celebrity that I met, Andy something, I think was his name. He was like drugged out of his mind um, someone will know. It's like Andy. I think he wears glasses. He's an older guy. Uh, some guy like came up and picked him in a car, uh, picked him up in a car. He actually asked for my number. Uh, it was pretty sketchy. Uh, outside this Ralph's grocery store we were at one night. And at that grocery store, uh, I was eating like mostly raw egg yolks and smoked salmon. Um, one night I had some raw lamb, which I didn't do again. You know, there's nowhere to cook in the hotel. Uh, one day I had some raw cheese, but it made me break out really badly and I had a zit. Um, uh, that thankfully went away in a couple days. So by the time I was filming, the zit was gone. Uh, but the food situation was really terrible. Uh, now that, that that story with that celebrity, I can't remember his name, but then I remember he tried to like take his bike, but he was too drunk. He fell off of it. Really, really funny. Um, someone in the comments will probably know his name. Uh, when it was my day to be filmed, 
Uh, my brother, you know, was kind enough to make the drive out to support me. I mean, it was maybe like 45 minute, an hour drive for him in LA, but you know, he's working all day. And then after, I think actually he had to take the day off, but, um, uh, so we have this little crowd outside, you know, where they're filming us, like cheering people on, whether they come out with an apron or not. And my brother was part of that crowd. I was part of that crowd for some of the day. And the actual part where I was to cook my dish went horrible. Uh, they told me I would have like time to take my suit jacket off and get set up, but they lied. Uh, I had uh, three attempts to make my dish in the test kitchen beforehand, and I never actually made the dish correctly. Um, so my dish was uh, like a lobster scallop noodle with sauterne zabayon, reduced lobster bisque. It wasn't too complicated of a dish. Uh, I saw this famous French chef. Raymond Blanc make a lobster scallop quenelle, which is like a spoonful of like basically fish puree and they poach it in like a broth. I tried doing that with noodles, which was a really bad idea. Um, if I made the quenelle, I might've been able to actually execute the dish. And I just had a really hard time, you know, doing it under stress in the test kitchen, but I practiced three times. I was comfortable for the show, but they didn't give me time to like get set up and prepare. They just like kind of threw me to the wolves super high EMF environment. You know, I didn't sleep at all the night before. I was super nervous. I literally sliced my hand open three times so badly. You know, there was blood everywhere, completely botched and messed up the dish. Couldn't get it done in time. You know, whether I, if I messed up the dish or not, would that have actually determined me getting on the show? I don't know. You know, there's a lot of things I could have done differently. Uh, maybe I'll show you guys that dish. Um, maybe I'll show you guys that dish this weekend, but, uh, yeah, I think uh, creativity-wise, it's it's pretty good. It's up there. I wouldn't say it's too complicated. Uh, it, it should have been something that was easy to do in 30 minutes. But under those conditions of you know me not having slept for two weeks, you know them, them throwing you into a high-pressure environment, um, me just all that combined, I didn't have the hand-eye coordination. I just completely filleted my hand open. There might have been a video um, back in. It would have been around like February, March, 2018 where you saw I had like, I'll look and see if I can find it. I had like um, wraps on my fingers and stuff. Um, but I think I might have deleted that video and I never re-uploaded it um, when I deleted the videos on my channel. So that moment in time, I'm like really disappointed. I know I messed up, I sliced my hand. I'm like in front of some of my idols like Joe Bastianich, Gordon Ramsay, Aron Sanchez. And you know, those guys are like made for TV. They've really practiced it. And I didn't really have much to say. You know, I was just kind of, and I, I Maybe if I did say something, it would have changed how things went, but I was just like so disappointed that I spent all this time, all this effort, and to mess it up by slicing my hand open to me was just, you know, kind of crazy. So like, I'm, they compared my dish with the black girl dish. Obviously they tore into me, you know, because I messed up the dish. You know, I found out I wasn't getting an apron. And when I went out, you know, the producer said, oh, do you want to film a shot where, you, you know, you have to like film a shot where you go out and you don't have an apron. And I didn't want to film the shot. I was just, I was pretty upset. I just wanted to leave. And, you know, they, they booked me a return flight to New York just a couple hours after that. So, you know, they immediately drove me to the hotel after I, um, after I didn't get an apron. They p packed everything up, you know, it was at the LA airport within like three, four hours. Uh, you know, my brother and my parents called me to see if I was okay and I was fine. I was just like not sleeping for two weeks. I was just hoping that when I went back to New York, I'd be able to sleep. Uh, I could have probably stayed out in LA and done a couple of things, but I wanted to get my YouTube channel back up and going and film some videos. Um, but the, the sleeping better part never happened. And that was the beginning of me, you know, figuring out a few things pertaining to my health. Overall, uh, definitely some positive, some negative learning experience. You know, worst thing was, you know, me losing that job, which was very lucrative income and my health correspondingly declining and I couldn't really work. Uh, thankfully, you know, my effort into my YouTube channel has given me a different direction in my life over these, um, the, you know, these next few years. Uh, I did get to cook a steak for Good Day New York Memorial Day, uh, which was fun. I'm sure some of you guys saw that video on my channel. Um, that was nice. My parents were really excited for that. And that was actually another night I didn't sleep. The, the one time I've ever worn makeup in my life was on MasterChef and on Good Day New York Memorial Day because I wasn't sleeping. I, they had to cover up my under eye bags because I, I, the lack of sleep, I looked like a zombie. 
If I was getting some sun and tanning, it might have been okay, but I actually ended up auditioning for MasterChef again the following year, uh, but they didn't want me on the show. Uh, so 2018 fall, I went to the audition. I made it through the first round of auditions again, and they never called me to be on the show. So uh, that ship has definitely sailed. It would have been a nice opportunity. You know, I really like culinary stuff, so I'm looking forward to maybe filming some pilots and producing some, some food-related stuff. Uh, hopefully in the near future, as cooking has always been a passion of mine. You know, the, the ingredients and the focus on um, on that is something that's given me an element to my YouTube channel that other people don't have. They don't understand how much how much I care about food, how much I like food, and how much time I've invested in food. Uh, maybe I'll get my, I'll see if my parents want to talk about, um, or my sister wants to talk about MasterChef and what they remember from it. Um, so let me go grab them. In hindsight, my parents probably don't really remember anything except I, you remember me asking you if you could make it out there and you guys just couldn't afford it, right? Yeah, it was twofold. Um, besides the course... Oh, he had the blood clot in his leg. I my, forgot about that. My husband yeah. had a blood clot in his leg. And um, it was such short notice. It was like, I think, a three-day window. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was and, like, you know, yeah. we have our daughter. We had no way to watch. And uh, it, was, it was very disheartening. I was so proud of him and so excited. I mean, we were there in our hearts, but we weren't physically there. So I asked um, our other son, Dante, you have to go and see your brother. He's on going to be on MasterChef. If you could at least just surprise him and be at the airport. Do you remember the rest? Yeah, no, and then he and then he came, ended up coming out to, uh, and then he ended up, no, I told him the story, like he came, he came out to support me. He, and he, was, he was there the for the, he was there for, to be in it. And... Then, but then when I came back, that's when I had the sleeping issues and I wasn't, uh, and I wasn't sleeping at all. In hindsight, when you think about it, we were just so proud that he got to that point. And I knew, even when he um, auditioned in New York, I said he had something so unusual with the bone marrow and whatever else he prepared. I yeah, said, I told him about the dish, yeah. Yeah, I said, I know he's going to be in it, but I didn't want to tell him because um, you just, in your heart of hearts, know it was going to happen. Well, the, the backstory too with the triplet, the the, the whole background, everyone, no one really had as unique of a background. Yeah, and, and not only that, the fact that he he endured, he unfortunately, um, it didn't work out that he filleted his fingers, but then he did get other opportunities. He was on, um, yeah, I told him was Channel on Five the, News, yeah. um, t t talking about grilling a steak. So I have to say the, the producers and everything of that show were really incredible how they reached out to him and he was still promoting the show. And I think it was a great experience for him. And like I said, we're just so happy he had that experience and, I always just say in general, do whatever your heart tells you to do and, and follow your dreams because everything's possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you.